afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to um, acknowledge and thank the organizers for inviting me here today um, and having a chance to speak on innovation and how digital technology is changing the Indian pharma pharmaceutical industry and how we've been using a lot of data through our AI engines to look at um, uh, you know, uh, operating models and the insights that we're getting from today. I also want to compliment the previous panelists. I think it was a great discussion, touching every aspect of uh, what we're doing in the pharma industry. Uh, I want to quote um, uh, Satya Nadella, who recently said that uh, AI is not just about the future of work, but it is the present. And I know that we can all resonate with it today. Because when I look at AI today, it's like a deep well, right? It's, it's like a deep well where you can see the light, you know, a glimmer of light bouncing off the surface, but you'll, you'll never know what the mystery of the bottom is, right? There's, there's so much that's unknown about it, and uh, we don't know when we'll ever be able to unravel. There's so much data on it. And I also think that... Um, uh, to the point I think Fanny made earlier, definitely uh, the needle has moved. Uh, traditionally, uh, the pharmaceutical uh, uh, you know, industry has been um, uh, very, very um, digital laggards, as I would say. And when a digital quotient assessment was conducted a couple of years ago, um, the pharmaceutical company turned out to have just about 27% in the digital quotient, as against the rest of the industries having more than 35% across. But sometimes it requires one event, one trigger to change the trajectory of, of our journey to, towards digital. And I think that um, with COVID, uh, that's something that really propelled us to change our uh, trajectory. Um, and I, particularly when I see uh, in terms of uh, the pharmaceutical industry where we've had such disruptions, such discontinuities, you know, people actually started thinking about whether the, tra the traditional way of working is going to, to be so. And uh, they started looking at leveraging the new technologies, not just in manufacturing and the way we distribute goods, but also uh, in the way we interact and engage with our consumers across the entire supply chain. There was another study that was done, uh, a global study that was done, uh, where it showed that uh, typically, digital leaders have a higher financial performance compared to the others. And companies having a higher digital quotient invariably have more than 2x growth in the revenues in the returns uh, to the shareholders. So if I look at the other extreme, or, you know, one extreme or one spectrum of uh, the pharmaceutical industry, which is R&D and drug discovery, we saw it play out in, you know, in our lifetime very recently, in its entire in, uh, uh, entirety, um, how the development and commercializations of vaccines took place recently. And till today, we believe that a typical program is, you know, at least a decade old. Today, with so much enormous amount of data, with internal data, external data, with, um, with so many databases, with uh, clinical records, it's allowing researchers to have more precision, more efficiency um, uh, you know, in their clinical trials and the outcome of the clinical, clinical trials. Equally, we're seeing that there's, uh, there's also a tremendous um, uh, pressure on the cost sensitivity and the speed to market. And, we, and therefore, we do see researchers looking for alternate tools to enhance their development program. I am seeing with our own group that we started using a lot of um, um, uh, uh, AI robots, AI cobots to automate our R&D. Because in, it's been my experience that even regulators today are accepting data out of virtual simulations as against conducting uh, you know, expensive, long clinical trials. Equally, when I look at uh, manufacturing today, manufacturing was the most hit uh, when it came through the COVID, right? There was a lot of uncertainty of operators being available, uncertainty of materials coming in time. There was a lot of supply disruption that happened 
um, uh, because of logistics and, 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 and what we saw was increase in prices in all of this. And um, it really meant that you know, we had to rewire our operationing mo operation model and think about um, how we're going to create an organization that's going to be more agile, more lean, more flexible, more efficient in, uh, in you know, increasing our output, minimizing costs, and improving our qualities. And in my organization, we actually took a very bold aspiration of uh, setting up digital in operations, where we set out as an aspiration to uh, put the you know, best in class uh, plants of the future, high performing plants of the future, um, that would be based on uh, uh, two big shifts, right? The first shift was on rewiring our uh, uh, operations, upgrading our technologies to really reduce and minimize uh, people dependence. The second one was employing data-based uh, analytics, and we saw a lot of performance enhancement with, uh, on the back of all the analytics that we could put in our systems. Equally, when I look at uh, the supply chain, uh, I would say the supply chain has also been uh, uh, quite disrupted with, um, uh, with the use of digital technology. And, um, uh, you know, with numerous ways, whether it is automation, whether it is big data analytics, and even a more nuanced way of actually today using drones for delivery. Um, I personally found this very, very, very useful uh, when I started getting granular visibility uh, for, um, uh, through the entire supply chain. Uh, that in itself, I think, uh, gave all uh, the advances uh, and the deliverables that one would expect of, uh, from uh, digital technology. And today we have our inventory tracked right from the time the order goes in to the time it is delivered. You know, we're having greater uh, visibility, decisions are made on the run. And if there is any bottlenecking to be done, you know, or, or the, the flow of the goods has to be uh, changed and altered, it's done through automated, uh, automated systems. Then moving further down uh, to um, sales and marketing as well, and we heard this from the panelists covering all of it. I think uh, in sales and marketing as well, there's been a lot of disruption, particularly during the pandemic. There was a pause in in-person meetings with the doctors. And uh, we saw how quickly companies adapted to platforms on digital and AA to, uh, to interact with doctors on various uh, digital platforms. And, and we did see that you know, we could unlock a lot of Salesforce performance as well. And um, the last but not the least is on environmental sustainability. And that's something very close to me. I think we did see a lot of impact on the use of uh, digital technologies on environment as well. I think five years ago, if we were asked to put our, uh, you know, wrap, uh, put our arms around to really see what our environmental uh, footprint is, it would have been very difficult and challenging to even know what our footprint or carbon footprint is. Uh, leave alone having aspirations for you know, setting targets for decarbonization or setting targets for water neutrality. But today, with all the digital technologies, we've seen that we've been able to uh, use right from the uh, time of our very finite resources that we have to the way we dispose it. We've been able to use dig digital technology in kind of changing the curve of how we're using, uh, you know, monitoring our environmental uh, sustainability uh, uh, metrics and parameters. And then, um, uh, you know, I I'm sure that a lot of you here in this room are already um, uh, you know, on this journey or planning to do this journey. I do believe that by the end of this decade, there will be just two types of companies. One that's adopted digital automation and AI and is leading the market. And perhaps the other that's you know, either the business is shrinking or they're going to find it difficult to be cost competitive. And this journey is one that definitely requires resilience. It is not something about short-term benefits. It is really about, um, you know, making, uh, building uh, institution-leading, industry-leading institutions that will leave behind a legacy in their wake. And I believe that transformation into a digital culture starts from the organization's leaders. Because over time, 
organizations become a shadow of their leaders. They pick up the characteristics of the leaders. And so it becomes, it's, it is very, very important for any such success that the leaders actually deliberate their role modeling in this. And I would say one more thing that I, you know, you can see a huge impact beyond, um, uh, beyond just what you do. It's across the entire ecosystem because when an organization progresses, it just empowers the entire ecosystem around it. And also it's beyond numbers. For, envi for instance, in environmental sustainability, right? It is, it's for the industry, it's for the country. Today, a country is setting up a net zero uh, uh, aspiration by 2070. And even for us to do business with other countries, their aspirations are much shorter than ours. Maybe Europe is 2050 uh, and US is 2050. But the journey has to start today. So with this, I think that uh, I'm actually very excited to see how it's going to play out in our sector. Um, it is definitely a journey of resilience. It's definitely a journey of, um, of demonstrating your leadership in this area. And, um, and I, I think that the way it's going to pan out is something that's going to be so fascinating and a way that we can't even predict. It's going to be unpredictable and, um, you know, the way it's just going to pan out. I don't think we can really think uh, very broadly on how, how this will really pan, this, uh, pan out. And uh, uh, to that point, um, you know, a, a quote from, Sham, uh, from um, uh, Stephen Hawking uh, comes to my mind where he says that it is very important for organizations to make sure that they are invested in artificial intelligence, but make sure that they are in control of it. And I'd just add that whatever we do, we have to take the accountability and responsibility that we use it correctly because it's like fire. It can give you light, it can give you warmth, right? But if you don't use it well, it can be quite dangerous. So with that, I appreciate your presence here today and uh, look forward to the rest of uh, the panelists talking in their lively conversations. Thank you.